Am I audible, Arti? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Sorry, there is some technical issue. Okay. No, tummy is coming. <laughs> all right. Can you um, hear us? I think for uh, all audiences online, uh, welcome to. Uh, Sorry, there is some technical issue. All right. See if offer something. All right, can you um, hear us? I think for the body online, uh, welcome to uh, this my YouTube channel. All right, apologies for the uh, delay. I think um, uh, what, we'll, uh, what we can do is we can start right now. Um, welcome uh, to our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Francio, Dr. Parisa, and uh, Arti, and all our uh, online listeners. Uh, welcome to the uh, second uh, Ayan Kali uh, conference and the Ayan Kali Memorial right. Lecture. And uh, just one second. Um, what we uh, start right now. Um, welcome uh, to our uh, panelists. Uh, just Sancho, one second, Lisa, I think. And, uh, and all our uh, online listeners. Uh, welcome to the uh, second uh, Ayankali uh, conference. And the Ayan... Sorry, there was, a, there was a repeat of the sound that was going on. Anyways, uh, so we've had uh, uh, already uh, uh, like a whole day of panel presentations uh, here in uh, Nagpur, India. We've had uh, all kinds of conversations, uh, original research papers from scholars from marginalized communities talking about public space, assertion, education, uh, sociocultural and legal uh, intersections of caste and social uh, structural reform. And uh, we've heard all kinds of uh, very interesting interventions. And uh, we are hoping that like, you know, we can round off day one with uh, the uh, discussions uh, from uh, both uh, Professor Franci and uh, Professor Kariza. And, uh, you know, the, the whole point of uh, this talk is that for us, Ayan Kali, uh, who is in my background in the sense, uh, looking over uh, all of us, Ayan Kali is, a, uh, is an icon of um, the anti caste struggle in uh, Kerala. Uh, which is in southern India and like, you know, in many ways, uh, he represents the indomitable spirit of uh, oppressed communities in trying to assert themselves. And we are hoping today to hear uh, from both uh, Dr. Francio and Dr. Carriza in terms of uh, like, you know, how uh, we can look at like a South-South uh, praxis, a, a, a connection, a conversation 
uh, between caste and race uh, and uh, try and look at building uh, uh, bridges of vocabulary between uh, uh, different marginalized groups uh, where our, our uh, oppression uh, may speak, uh, may, may, may have different trajectories, but our expression and assertion uh, you know, forms a similar uh, points of uh, unconventional uh, and uh, anti-systemic uh, 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 articulation. Uh, without taking too much time, uh, uh, I am Ravikant on behalf of uh, Samyak uh, uh, Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Digital Nalanda and Nalanda Academy. And uh, I hand over uh, the, the reins to uh, Arti Kade, who's a former uh, uh, alumni, actually former alumni is uh, Ms. Nomar, is an alumni of uh, Nalanda Academy and uh, she does us proud and she's currently right now uh, studying in the University of Amsterdam. And Aarti, I want you to uh, please uh, do justice to this uh, session and introduce our uh, speakers to a wider audience. We all look forward uh, to hearing more from, uh, from all of you. Over to you, Aarti. Thank you, uh, Ravikant sir. Uh, actually, this voice voice is echoing. Thank you, Ravikant sir. Um, Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity today. Uh, Jai Bhim and Jai Savitri to uh, everyone. My name is Aarti Kade. I'm alumni of Nalanda Academy, currently pursuing PhD in Anthropology from University of Amsterdam. Today we are uh, here for second Ayan Kali Memorial Lecture. Welcome uh, you all and thank you for joining us today. I will start with brief introduction of Mahatma Ayan Kali. My, Mahatma Ayankali is known for his contribution to the anti-caste struggle in India. He launched the struggle for human rights and the rights of education of Dalit people in Travancore, the princely state that is now southern Kerala, and a few talukas of Tamil Nadu in early 1890s. He organized the earliest public protest and collective struggle for social justice and civil, uh, civil liberties for people who were treated as untouchables in Kerala. He struggled for the rights of Sajasabha, uh, Travancore's Legislative Assembly of the was born on 28 August 1863. At Pulaya and therefore untouchable himself, he experienced the breath of caste. Ayankali bro broke the ban on the entry of Delhi communities into public roads in the last 19th century. So the cities of card rights from 1891 to 1893, the culmination of which was historic con confrontation with the caste Hindu Militia. He used the ceremonial uh, bullock cards pulled by two white bulls with bell tied to them for this historic freedom of movement agitations all over South Travancore. For his bullock rights, he wore white clothes and white turban that defied the caste Hindu lords and drew their fury. Ayankali also broke the imposition of restrictive dress codes, dress codes and humiliating rituals like Kalumala, the crude ornament that Dalit women were uh, forced to wear. In Kalumala struggle that followed the Pirinad revolt in Kolam in 1915. He also spotted the distinct moustache, which again was denied to Dalit persons by caste Hindu system. He started a traditional Kerala school at Veganuth in 1904, which was later attacked and burned down by caste Hindus. He continued the struggle for entry of Dalit children into public funded schools and obtained a royal decree in 1907. But the caste Hindu clerical lord suppressed that order and series of ag agitations and revolt continued 1915 to bring that decree into effect. For the children, 
Pulaya farmers under the leadership of Ayangali declared, if our kids are not allowed to enter your, your schools, your paddies will uh, grow near weeds. I salute his struggle and heartily uh, congratulate Nalanda Academy for taking forward the legacy of Mahatma Ayankali and organizing this conference. For second Ayankali Memorial Lecture, we have two esteemed uh, guests with us. We have with us Dr. Sancio Guadalupe, who is a senior researcher at Royal Netherlands Institute for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies and associated, uh, associate professor in Social and Cultural Anthropology at University of Amsterdam. He is author of Chanting Down the New Jerusalem uh, and uh, Black Man in the Netherlands. Uh, we have another special guest um, who is Dr. Charisa Granger, who is music musicologist and lecturer in cultural studies at the University of West Indies. Her research focuses on Afro-American Caribbean uh, diasporic music making and performances as decolonizing practices. Sharisa was a uh, Mary Sklodovsa Curie leading fellow at in Iram's University Rotterdam and is postdoctoral research researcher in NWO funded Islanders at Helm Research Project. I welcome you both. Uh, Jaibim, thank you so much for joining us despite a very short notice. Uh, we are privileged to have you both here. Um, I would like to share with both of you that the analogy between caste system and racism uh, has much longer and sustained history. In 1873, uh, Jyotira Phule, an important social revolutionary uh, in Maharashtra, uh, begin his polemical Gulamgiri with a dedication to American abolitionist. Uh, in 1940s, Dr. Ambedkar contacted the voice to inquire about a petition to the UN which attempted to secure minority rights for black people through the UN Council. Dr. Ambedkar explained that he had been a student of black Sorry, Arati, I believe that you are muted all of a sudden. Oh. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so Du Bois responded uh, to Dr. Ambedkar telling he was familiar with his niece and that he had every sympathy with the untouchables of India. Nearly 30 years later, an organization led by a Dalit artist and activist named themselves Dalit Panthers in reference with, to the Black Panthers in US in their manifesto issued 1971. The Panthers wrote from the Black Panthers, Black power was established. We claim close relationship with this struggle. Dalit and Shudra caste women and people with marginalized genders have been much inspired by works of Sojourner Truth, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, and many others. On this note, on this note, I, uh, Francio, I invite you to please share your thoughts with us. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Lem Good afternoon. Let me just first share my uh, PowerPoint with everyone. See if I can get it to work correctly. There we go. Yes, good afternoon again. I am very delighted to be here because to me, this is the land of Tendulkar. Uh, I like cricket. <laughs> it's, it's the land of the wall, Rahul David. And of course, there's always been a connection between cricket in the West Indies and cricket in India. I know that when I was in India, that Viv was, was a, Richards was a very famous person. I know that people liked Brian Lara. So it's always a pleasure to, to be speaking here. Um, I would also uh, fully like to acknowledge that what Arati said is correct about the connections between the black struggle and the, the caste struggle, so the struggle against racism and the struggle against caste. 
for us from the West Indies, we have to recognize that the West Indies only came about because there was also the influence of India from the inception. So you can't think the West Indies and you can't think West Indian critical theory, not critical race theory, but West Indian critical theory without recognizing the contribution of those whose ancestors were indentured laborers and who labored with the people of African descent in the Caribbean. So for me, when I speak about a new common, and it's about notes of solidarity, from the perspective of the Caribbean, it always also already from the inception contains the presence of India, the radical presence of India. Because if it's one place that the caste system ceased to exist, it was in the West Indies. When the indenture came to the West Indies, caste was destroyed. And therefore, many of the thinkers from the West Indies always push an anti-caste uh, perspective whenever they're doing things. So let me now start. I do what is called a, a anthropology to come. So I, I don't ever think that I'm doing a Western science because for me, the West is not a place, but the West is a project, a project based upon the subjugation of people and the subjugation of the earth and the subjugation of animals. That project you not only find in Europe and the United States, but you find it across the globe. So what we have to do is constantly undo that project to actually create an anthropology to come. So I do an anthropology that is coming, coming into being. Now, the first thing to recognize is that colonial domination, imperialism was never only based upon guns and economic exploitation. It was not only what was done during the Moran Bay um, suppression in Jamaica and the Sepoy rebellion and suppression in India, it was also based upon compromise knowledge. And that compromise knowledge was promoted in schools, in universities, in museums, in civil associations and media. And it gave people a distorted image of themselves. Secondly, anthropology today would actually mean that you do a kind of science that is in the service of radically questioning, radically undoing. Uh, nowadays, they say deconstructing the colonially inherited uh, subject subjectivities, the colonially inherited identities. So you're actually what you're undoing is not only racism, but racialism. When you look at yourself and you see a race and you don't see a human being in the mirror, you have to first see a human being with a history. So anthropology is about demolishing false images, images that presuppose that some people are better than other people based upon where they live, based upon their surnames, based upon their ethnicity, based upon their religion, and so forth and so forth. And lastly, it would mean that you also tap into less acknowledged knowledge practices. So you have to presuppose that people like I learned from Arati, people like Ayankali, people like Ambedkar, they have to be part of the curriculum of the globe. They too should be universalized like Immanuel Kant and Karl Marx have been universalized. These persons, these unknown, less known knowledge practices, they have to be part of the everyday curriculum in places where I teach, like for instance, the University of Amsterdam. Now I'm going to try and today discuss one such knowledge practice, the knowledge practice coming out of much of the Rastafari uh, traditions. What you now see is a whole lot of revolts and protest in the Netherlands. Revolts against the way immigrants are treated, revolts against racism, revolts against uh, xenophobia, against uh, anti-Islam and so forth. And the Black Lives Matter protests for sure. So you could say, if I follow West Indian critical theory, you would say there was fire in Babylon, not fire, but fire. Fire meaning a mystical flame that is constantly undoing 
all kinds of oppressions. So there is fire, there's a mystical flame, mystical flames seeking to undo it. And that mystical flame is carried by the actions of human beings, of all kinds of ethnicities uniting together to undo the system. Now, when you recognize that all this fire is taking place, all this upsurge, then you see that it troubles these images that are usually portrayed about the Europe, the United States and Canada, where it seems like everyone is living in harmony with one another. And then oftentimes Europe and the United States like to push the idea that they actually have arrived in a post-racial society. And you would have to say post-racial, my ass. Well, the person that they push or pushed as the image of post-racialism, which was the American President Obama, he had this to say. He said, to say that we are one people, and he's talking about American people, is not to suggest that race no longer matters, that the fight for equality has been won, or that the problems that minorities face in this country today are largely self-inflicted. We know the statistics. As much as I insist that things have gotten better, because things have gotten better, I am mindful of the truth as well. Better isn't good enough. It's not good enough if you still have Black Lives Matter protests, even though things have gotten better. There's still a lot to do, still a lot of fighting to do. So this explains why, even though you have the image of a kind of rainbow harmony, and even though there is progress, I mean, I'm a professor at the University of Amsterdam, there is still struggle. There is still that perpetual fire, that perpetual mystical flame trying to burn out all the negativities that are part still of the system uh, in the Western world. Now, you might ask yourself, where is Babylon? Because I say fire in Babylon. And in West Indian critical theory, Babylon consists of these things. Babylon is the division of humankind into the property. So people who have wealth, enormous amounts of wealth, they are the property. They are full-fledged subjects. Secondly, Babylon is divided into the so-called free. The so-called fee are subjects that are structurally objectified. All that means the so-called free are people who can attend the university, who might actually be able to buy a house uh, based upon having a mortgage. They are a professional and they think they're free, but they're still being controlled by that small group, the property that controls everything. And oftentimes they get compromised knowledge and they push compromised knowledge to others. The third component of Babylon is the so-called slaves. The so-called slaves are subjects treated as objects. It means people who are thingified, who are treated as though they are things. A slave is a so-called thing. It's a human being that you think you can treat as an object, as something, a means towards your ends, not a means or an end in themselves. Babylon consists also of a compulsory raciality. That means that you know Babylon is around when we look at each other and we see racial categories. Babylon forces human beings to actually look at each other in racial categories. That's part of Babylon too. So not only the division of humankind in these three generic classes. And thirdly, Babylon is about the treatment of the planet as a means, as property, as an object. And that has gotten us into this climate change um, debacle that we're in right now. So in West Indian critical theory, Babylon signifies these three things. It's about how human beings oppress other human beings. It's about the work of race. 
And it's about how we treat the planet and everything that lives on it as though it's our property that we can exploit as we see fit. So when you look at this image and you recognize that there's a threefold division, the property, the so-called free, and the so-called slaves, then you recognize that I recognize that who is actually bringing the fire to Babylon? When you look at these images, they are actually the so-called free. There are people who have at least some income who are at universities. These are the people that you see in the images. It does not mean that the so-called free are not fighting. And the so-called, sorry, the so the so-called slaves, the Dalits, the formerly enslaved does not mean that they're not fighting, but it means that when you look at the media images, it's usually about the so-called free. They are the ones you get primarily, their struggle is the struggle you see primarily in the dominant mass media. It's an important struggle, but it's only part of the struggle. I will take step two. Let's look at the so-called slaves that we spoke about the so-called free, and that's people like me, people like Arati. Let's now look at who are the so-called slaves in the Americas, and then we're looking from the 1500s to the 1800s. So these are the so-called, if they're not the so-called slaves, and then remember we're looking with eyes that are not Babylon's eyes. So we're seeing the many colors of humanity, but these many colors of humanity are what some people would call the middle classes or the aspiring middle classes. People who, who go to universities or work at universities or who are lawyers or who are doctors or who are oftentimes activists who can live off of their activism. If you're looking for the so-called slaves, they are these people. And I'm going to give you a geographically and historically specific answer. It is the descendants of these people after slavery. They were still struggling. The descendants of the people who came from the African continent, 12 million. It is these also, it is the descendants and the people who lived in the Americas and in the Caribbean beforehand, the American Indians, and the way they were shackled and forced to work for less than nothing. They were treated as so-called slaves too. It is also these people and their early descendants, the people who came from India, Sri Lanka, China, who were indentured laborers and treated as though they were so-called slaves, things. It is these people, again, the Chinese, who were also indentured, and these you also had in the Caribbean, indentured persons from Europe the Irish that oftentimes died on the plantations. So all these people and their descendants in the earliest times, and many of them still today, are the so-called slaves, still the strugglers. If I look at the descendants of these people to zoom in, then what they faced was racism. And I think it's important to recognize that racism is a set of actions. Racism is not an ideology solely, it's a set of actions. And I'm using two people here, Barbara Fields and Karen Fields. They have a very important book, it's called Racecraft. I think you should read it. I have a quote here and I'm going to read out that quote slowly. I've underlined the passages that I think is very important. They write, Racism is first and foremost a social practice, which means that it is an action and a rationale for action, or both at once. Racism transforms what an aggressor does into race, something the target is. So here's they're going to give a good example of it. Consider the statement, black Southerners were segregated because of their skin color. Again, the sentence, black Southerners were segregated because of their skin color. Nowadays, we might say 
Black Americans are being killed by the police because of their skin color. Or perhaps in India, you might say, the Dalits are being segregated and beaten because of their caste. And here's what Barbara Fields will say. That seems like a perfectly natural sentence to the ears of most. But what you overlook is the weird causality. Because in the sentence, the action disappears and it becomes a trait of the other person. We get it? So they're saying with racism, you need to recognize that racism is always an act of the other person. It has nothing to do with the person that's being oppressed. But what racism makes you think is that people are being oppressed because of their skin color, because of their caste. No, it has nothing to do with that. They're being oppressed because someone is oppressing them. So Barbara Fields and Karen Fields are saying, look at the person that's committing the action. And when you look at the action, then you understand what racism is. And perhaps in the discussion, we can have that. Perhaps that is also what cost is. It's the actions of aggressors vis-a-vis -vis other persons. Let me continue. We nowadays take racism and the idea of race to be just generic common sense. But we have to ask ourselves, how was it made? How did it come about in Babylon that we start to see each other in these racial categories? And here's some authors who have been thinking about this. One of them is Ashilam Bembe, a Cameroonian philosopher. If racism is actions of an aggressor actually acting and hurting, subjugating, oppressing, dominating a group of other people. Achille Mbembe says, in the 1670s, what was important was how do you deploy a large number of laborers from Africa to actually the Americas? He says, the answer will be you invent blackness. Africans were not black. Africans were Yoruba. They were Ashanti. They were many different kinds of people. And they never saw themselves as being black people. But when Europe, Europeans decided, hey, we need a bunch of cheap laborers that we pay nothing, we have to legitimate our actions. And the legitimation of the actions was to say, these people are black people and therefore we can oppress them. So it was the invention of blackness in the 1600s. Then is when people of African descent became black. And since then, people look at them, look at me, and say Black people. But it was part of racism. Dimitris Udell, thinking from the Caribbean, says, this understanding that these people were Black people, again, it differed substantially from the people's self-conceptions. It turned the multi-tribal, multicultural peoples into a completely new historic entity the Negro, the Black. In the 1600s, people living on that continent and their descendants in the Americas became Black people. Take step three. To the genesis of the so-called free, you recognize how the so-called slaves became Black. Now we go to the so-called free and we look at the genesis, again from the 1800s to the 1900s. This is the making of a race again. If Babylon is compulsory raciality, how did we ever come to look at people who live in that Asian peninsula that we nowadays call Europe and call them white? How did that happen? This is again the making of a race, just like the people who lived on that large landmass connected to Asia that we call Africa became black. Let's look at how these other people became white. This is an author that I use when I teach in the University of Amsterdam, an old sociologist. This old sociologist, Philippe Boucher, is a Frenchman. Actually, when I read the quote, you'll see that he taught of Europe as consisting of many different races. This is the quote, let me read it slowly. Consider a population like ours, 
and he's talking about Europe, placed in the most favorable circumstances, possessed of a powerful civilization, amongst the highest ranking nations in science, the arts and industry. Our task now, I maintain, is to find out how it can happen that within a population such as ours, races may form, not merely one, but several races, so miserable, inferior, and bastardized that they may be classed below the most inferior savage races, or their inferiority is sometimes beyond cure. Philippe Bouchez, in talking about these inferior bastardized races, he was talking about his uh, compatriots, people in France. Nowadays, people look at all French people and say they belong to the white race. But in the 1800s, Philippe Bouchez was still making a distinction between Frenchmen and those that he considered that could not be cured, could not be fixed, could not be elevated. Those, he said, we should actually export them to the colonies. And that happened. That happened also in Great Britain. That is what happened with the Irish in the Caribbean. Robin Kelly, as he puts it, the Slavs and the Irish were, for example, were among Europe's first niggers. And what appears before us in the 19th century US history as their struggle to achieve whiteness is merely a tip of an iceberg several centuries old. Again, what Kelly is saying, let's recognize how this compulsory raciality emerged. And let's recognize that not everyone in Europe at the start of colonization was considered white and part of those that are property. Many of them were treated as so-called slaves. The Slavic people from where the term slave comes from and the Irish. This is another example of how people saw the Irish as being close to the African. The English is the one in between. And there you have the, the Irish on one side and the African on the other side. I'm coming to the end. Arati, how much time do I have? Could you just mention it? Uh, you have five more minutes. Okay, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go quickly. These authors, Peter Limburg and Marcus Redeker, are figures in the many-headed Hydra who speak about the unity between the peoples who were treated as so-called slaves. How enslaved Africans, indentured Irish, Amer Indians, and people who were indentured uh, Indians and Chinese, how they were working together to try to break the system. It was never solely um, separate struggles. There was enough times when people united to actually try to undo the system that was oppressing them. Briefly, Kelly, what Kelly does is he says, to understand how we've come into a world in which we think people should be separated, you need to recognize that laws were passed to try to break certain things. So in the 17th century, you had laws against what is called interracial marriage. Prior to that, people were marrying across lines and people were fighting across lines. So slowly, all these laws, as he said, what they did was they helped to destroy any potential unity across those color lines and made a line sharper between black and white or white and other. Again, Dubois, again, an example of that where Dubois says, to break the unity between the poor whites and the poor blacks, what happened was that they created a special wage, the wage of whiteness, a psychological wage. So you would be as poor as the poorest African-American, but you could always claim I'm white. That was your extra wage. And so you're creating the so-called free, those who think that they are different than the so-called slaves, but they're living in almost destitute poverty. Nell Irvin Painter, I'm coming to the end, uh, a historian who did a wonderful book called A History of White People, where she slows how slowly more and more people in Europe and in the Americas became white. 
So in the Netherlands, in the 1900s, the image you're seeing above in a kind of mud hut, that is how the majority of the people in the Netherlands lived in the time of colonization. Because we often forget colonization and imperialism was done externally to the colonies, but internally there was also colonization. And people lived in abject poverty. This is the point of Nell Irvin Painter. And what she says is that when you look at the GI Bill and after the Second World War, then most people in Europe start to become middle class. Prior to that, the middle class is small, the upper class is small, but the working class and the lump and proletariat, the poor, the so-called slaves, they are the majority. And it's only after that that you get the so-called free who forget that if they scratch a little bit, they will find an impoverished person in their family tree. I'm going to skip this because that image of why they can't see it is the image of racism. And you see how racism created images of, uh, of the subjugated across the globe. I'm going to pause this. Racism is a kind of taxonomy. It's a genealogy, but I'm going to go further because I don't want to take the, the time of, of Dr. Granger. Racism creates racialism. And racialism, that compulsory raciality, has forced us to look at the globe in this way. And if you look well for this conference, you see a Hindu civilization. I come from the West Indies. I know that there is Hinduism that is constitutive of the West Indies. You can't find it in the images of the world. Islam is constitutive of the West Indies. You can't find it. Christianity is constitutive of the West Indies. The West Indies, as an example, is a place that undoes the idea of separated civilizations and continents. So step four, last step, the situation today. The people who struggled, who were called so-called slaves that we don't see in the struggles that we see in mass media, they are still struggling against their situation. And if we ask what became of them, the so-called slaves, then we need to recognize that like all over the globe, across the globe, sorry, what they did was they employed the weapons of the weak, so which means an example, very uh, known example is that uh, when people who were treated as slaves were caught supposedly stealing, what they said is, how is it possible, master, that I stole your chicken? The chicken is your property, I'm your property, so I can't be stealing, you can't actually punish me. It's an example of it. They openly revolted when they could, they ran away, meaning they committed maronage, and they performed the spirit of the times when the times were catching up to them. And here is the connection to Ambedkar and the connection to Ayankali. And then I will end with this. The connection is that you can't think of human rights, universal human rights, without recognizing the struggle in Haiti. The French Revolution of liberty, equality, and fraternity, which Ambedkar pushed, only matters because in that now impoverished country of Haiti, you had a successful slave revolt that said, if it is to be liberty, equality, and fraternity, liberté, égalité, as they called it, equality, then it means that no person should be treated as a so-called slave then it means that the property have to start sharing their wealth. That ideology, that global vision of liberty, equality, and fraternity is to me the struggle, as I read it, that Ayankali was pushing when he said, it's no way that the Dalit should be treated as less, that Ambedkar was pushing, and I've just put four people who I work with, who are persons of West Indian descent, scholars, 
Patricia Mohamed in the middle who said, and if the struggle of liberty, equality, and fraternity, it should also mean gender, the position of women. Gabriel Hussein, Anton Alahar, who mixes West Indian critical theory with Marxism, and Sam Selvon to end, who is who was a novelist and an essayist, and who said, we cannot, if we want to push a new common, we cannot divide the world the West Indies into Indian, African, European, and so forth. We are all West Indians. That's our common. Wherever one person is struggling, regardless of how that person looks, regardless of their sex or gender, we are all struggling because we actually have to found a world based upon that liberty, equality, and the new common global fraternity. I hope I have not taken up too much of your time. Thank you for this. And I'm going to end. We continue the, the legacy, but remember that some people aren't the so-called slaves anymore. They belong to the property, like Beyonce Nolis. And that means the struggle cannot be a racial struggle, but it's a struggle against the inequity that's taking place in the world. Thank you. And I'm going to stop my sharing now. Thank you so much, Francio. Uh, you directly said there's still a lot to do and racism as well as caste is, is not the reality, but it is the action of the operation. Uh, now I invite Sharita to please, please uh, share your thoughts with us. Right. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to um, thank Arati for the introduction, um, as well as Dr. Guadalupe for setting the scene for us. Um, I'd like to begin with a guiding quote. Our strategy should not be only to confront empire, but to lay siege to it, to deprive it of oxygen, to shame it, to mock it with our art or music or literature or stubbornness or joy or brilliance or sheer relentlessness and our ability to tell our own stories, stories that are different from the ones we're being brainwashed to believe. The corporate revolution will collapse if we refuse to buy what they are selling, their ideas, their versions of history, their wars, their weapons, their notion of inevitability. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Arundhati Roy, War Talk.
another world is not only possible, but on the way, upside down, left, right, turn around. Today we come to paint the town blue. An erotic celebration, a creative practice, a ritual that takes place at 3 a.m. until daybreak and sunrise. Juve costumes are self-made from discarded or soon to be discarded materials and cloths. Old putties and chamber pots become rum vessels. Baby bottles and pacifiers become part of the street theater where grown men become babies and baby dolls, which are single mothers that are looking for their unacknowledged child's father. They also become damn Lorraine's, voluptuous women who live by their own conscripts. All cans, car packs, and biscuit tins are used for making rhythm so that devils can dance. <laughs> Coming out of emancipation struggles, Juve performs what Rinaldo Walcott describes as the unfinished project and promise of emancipation towards which we are still working. Juve attempts to fulfill the disfigured and broken promises of freedom, possibilities of life and livability that exceed and are uncontained by the trauma, the legacies of enslavement, the persistent coloniality, the sound of the music and the accompanying performance is one of sustainability, recycle, repurpose, remake, and reinvention. A sound of reinvention like the chappy, a garden hoe turned plantation tool, turned music instrument, an instrument that loudly proclaims humaning, or like the steel pan, from oil barrels to melodic, harmonic, and rhythmic orchestra invented instruments in which practitioners are and can reinvent themselves in performance or oh, the livingness that this breeds. This is where multiple characters, such as we can see on the screen, devils come out to play. Jumbies together with the previous characters mentioned populate the early morning atmosphere as performers are drenched in paint, powder, mud, oil, motor oil in the darkness of night, which offers the opportunity to play yourself. Performing the multiple parts of yourself, this is humaning. This is a personal meditation of experiencing Caribbean juvies, an advent, an event during carnival that has performed on me and that I performed for many years across the Caribbean diaspora, Aruba, London, Antigua, Port of Spain. Juve is in line with planetary solidarity in a climate where we are too slowly understanding that the individual is not a unit of care. 
that the individual is indeed a unit of capitalism, that care is an interconnected ecological possibility. And poet and Black feminist scholar Alexis Pauline Gom says that we have to honor that ecology. While performing and experiencing Juve this year, I was studying some of Sylvia Winter's work on wonder and the enchantment of the re-enchantment of the human. Sylvia Winter is Cuban Jamaican dancer, actor, playwright, novelist, professor emerita at Stanford University, who interrogates critically being human as praxis in the wake of colonialism, enslavement, and Caribbean independence movement. So I offer a departing tenet of Winter. And she says, what at once becomes clear is this, rather than positing that we humans have a poverty problem or a habitat problem or energy problem or a trade problem or a pollution problem or an atmosphere problem or a waste problem or a resource problem, these, she says, on a planetary scale are understood together as interconnected problems. Thus thinking globally, what we really have, she says, is a poverty, hunger, habitat, energy, trade, pollution, atmosphere, waste resource problem with dashes that suggest the interconnectedness. And she says, none of these separate parts can be solved on their own. They all interact and are interconnected and thus together, are constitutive of our species is now seemingly incapable, unresolved, global, problematic. So on a planetary scale, these seemingly individual problems need to be attended to and understood as interconnected. To approach this interconnected problem, we need to trouble disciplinary boundaries, she says, so that thinking with Caribbean poet and essayist, Emma Césaire, Sylvia Winter calls for a rewriting of knowledge as we know it. And Dr. Um, Guadalupe mentioned that, right? Um, to acknowledge the less acknowledged knowledge practices, right? Especially for me in the, in the happening of life that Professor Guadalupe talked about. So she calls for a rewriting of knowledge as we know it encouraging us to imagine, to think and envision a new science of the world. So Emir Césaire says then that science of, affords a view of the world, but a summary and superficial view. She says scientific num, um, knowledge, it enumerates, it measures, it classifies, and it kills. He says it is necessary to add that it is poor and half starved. To acquire it, he says, mankind has sacrificed everything, desires, fears, feelings, psychological complexes. To acquire the impersonality of scientific knowledge, mankind depersonalized itself, de-individualized itself. An impoverished knowledge, I submit, he says, for at its exception, whatever other wealth it may have, there stands an impoverished humanity. Further, he says then that side by side with this half star scientific knowledge, there is another kind of knowledge, a fulfilling knowledge. Scientific truth, he says, has as its sign coherence and efficacy, efficacy. And then poetic truth has as its sign beauty. Poetry is that process which through word, image, myth, love and humor establishes me at the living heart of myself and of the world. Then the time, he says, will come again when the study of the word, the study of the word, the study of art practice, the study of cultural practice will condition the study of nature. So we have an interconnected problem as outlined previously to which change can only be brought about by the dissolving disciplinary boundaries, right? So Winter argues that to let go of disciplinary boundaries means that we can begin to make sense of the practices of being human. Here, the purely biological definition of what it means to be human, which scientific knowledge offers us of being human, she says it is insufficient. So that a reinvention of the human takes us beyond where we are stuck 
in our conceptions of what it means to be human, namely the Western European, Euro-American, biocentric, economic-centric conception of being human, where the self is understood and defined by needing the invented other, the wretched of the earth, the dame, les dames de terre, as Fanon puts it. That's the made up other that is needed to define the self. So Winter makes clear that a nature culture hybrid conception is a more generative understanding since here the self does not need an other, does not need to invent an other for its own understanding. In this way, scientific knowledge stands in relation to poetic knowledge. Disciplinary boundaries function, she says, to secure our current world order, holding the poverty, hunger, habitat, energy, trade, pollution, atmosphere, resource, resource problem intact. This intactness mean, uh, means a world order where the Euro-American conception of man with a capital M is at the center. This is anthropocentrism. We then must move beyond disciplinary boundaries to attend to the local and planetary collated problem, an interconnected problem where Euro-American imperial and global capitalist man then comes to stand for and is overrepresented as human. So anthropocentrism, and the unequal, unbalanced distribution of resources, degradation, and destruction of natural environment and natural resources are the effects of the imbalance between science and the humanities, between scientific knowledge and poetic knowledge as described by Césaire. So thinking together with Winter then, Christina Sharp says that despite Knowing otherwise, we are often disciplined to think through and along lines that re-inscribe our annihilation, reinforcing and reproducing what Sylvia Winter has called our narratively condemned status. And Christina Sharp then says, we must become undisciplined. The work we do requires new modes of methods, new modes and methods of research and teaching. So to become undisciplined, and not to think through the lines that can cause our demise, I turn to Juve. Doing so to move from the conception of man with a capital M, where the Afrospora, the unhoused, the jobless, the wretched of the earth are used as an other to Western man's understanding of self. Such a move has to be primarily a move in the cultural realm according to Winter. It has to be a move in the cultural realm, according to Winter. So I offer Juve as a Caribbean cultural practice for thinking through and practicing this move. This move occurs in the languaging and for Dr. Guadeloupe and I in the experiencing, making and performing that occurs in the practice of being human. Until such a re-enchantment of the human comes about, Planetary concerns such as climate migration, economic inequity, race, gender, class, ethnicity struggles, global warming, environmental conflicts will remain unchanged. So Juve offers for me a critical insight that calls into question the world system and the subjugation that most often comes with it. It offers brief glimpses, glimmer of hope, glimmers of hope as an alternative of how to respond to the problem, it creates something different, which the epistemological problem or project of winter calls for. It disrupts the coloniality of being, of power, of truth, of freedom. It is where the literary, intellectual, and the natural sciences bounce up and meet each other. Among performers in the diaspora, there are references such as Mokujambis, Jab Jab, Devils, Juve, spirits that come out to play, ordering a particular grammar of emancipation, the aesthetic of which informs the performance. So this performance expands even after Juve is over. It opens a window for possibilities. It cues for the imagination. The performance, of, the performance offers ways of being and living otherwise in this world and to think and to theorize from that livingness. 
possibilities it offers further of imagining and making beauty in a shared way in a co-created equilibrity to live outside the imposed conception of human racial, racial and class logics an erotic performance that fulfills the promise of freedom, according to Saidia Hartman, and the unfinished project of emancipation, according to Rinaldo Walcott. The natural sciences has made progress in understanding the non-human, according to Sylvia Winter, for understanding the non-human world, while the humanities, she says, are still grappling with how we organize our world that includes large scale inequalities and degradation that our current ways of being are causing. So we need a Judith Poetics to account for the parameters of collective humaning. Judith illustrates that the bios, the biological way of understanding what it means to be human is obsolete. And an alternative of practicing being human, of humaning, is possible after man. A conception that does not live on the self, other, us, them, we, they binaries of self definition. Jube performs the hybrid, the bio, and the cultural that Winter argues is human. Jube offers a poesis that temporarily sheds the present conception of man. This offering is tenuous, a fleeting mode of being. Jube is a performance that one is part of, that one works to form, that, but that also works on you in such a way as to reinvent you continuously. It offers us a new science of the human that we can think further, a more through which to think to dissolve disciplinary boundaries, to bring about equilibrity, multiplicity is put into play. Being human as praxis, humaning often in the face of sustained negation of humanness, of non-being. This is a constellation or infrastructure of self-definition. So Jube opens a science of human systems, poetic knowledge. Caribbean creative practices are subversive of the normative, for it is here that a reinvention occurs using the radical imagination, animated by pleasure, small practices of freedom, part of the quotidian everyday practices of revolution. The political work of love here, um, where selves were reinvented, made and remade, as instruments were refashioned out of garden holes, oil barrels, cow horns, conch shells, donkey jaw bones, calabash gourds, a remaking that calls on no other for how the remade self constitutes being anew, a neither for understanding that being. All the centrisms are suspended. In this performance, multiple beings emerge to play human concealed in that So I'm going to wrap there um, because I was flagged for time. Um, but I just want to say one last thing um, where Winter talks about um, what we do not know. And this is called some what she calls ontological sovereignty. And she says, we know about economic sovereignty. We know about political sovereignty, but something remains untouched, which is ontological sovereignty. And she says, I'm, I'm being so bold as to say, she says, that in order to speak the conception of ontological sovereignty, we would have to move completely outside our present conception of what it means to be human. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharita. You have uh, touched the very central question of uh, central of 
all of our struggle that is what is being human and you have rightly said that uh, impoverished humanity stands with impoverished knowledge uh, i want to share with you that in in india we have a, a long a legacy of um uh, knowledge which which tries to bring the idea of different human being uh, dr ambedkar launched the uh, movement for conversion to the buddhism uh, buddhism which uh, discusses the idea of different uh, or alternate human being different idea of beauty and different idea of aesthetics uh, we also have a, a legacy of anti caste music from uh, vamanada kardak uh, who who starts uh, his uh, music with saluting to the humanity uh, by singing the song which in which he says salute the humanity and and we have uh, shital sate today who is a dalit woman through her music uh, she brings the different idea of beauty so uh, this is uh, this is this was wonderful uh, very enlightening thank you so much uh, now i open the floor for discussion uh, if anybody have any question for francia and sharita um, please um, yeah anybody have any question also for those who are watching on youtube uh, please type your question in the comment box Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for the wonderful, you know, conversation and sessions. Uh. on situated knowledge is uh, you know these are very important resistant pro you know projects of uh, knowledge production uh, that happens you know within different geographical locations uh, but since i am a since i am a scholar interested in anti caste literature specifically uh, from the vantage point of understanding dalit women's lives i just uh, my question is op- uh, op- for both the you know professors uh, i just want to have your understanding or you know your take on what uh, an emancipatory dalit feminist project can uh, learn from you know uh, anti race or uh, you know knowledge production so uh, already there there has been uh, efforts to build bridges between you know how how the nature of oppression even though it's it's not entirely same uh oppression still connects us and and our resistance to fight it every day so 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 yes i mean that's it thank you so much did you go first sharifa first i go first um i can go um so i think so i would just say hello okay that's better all right so i think i would um 
consider, and thank you for your question, first off. Um, I would consider, you know, when we're talking about studying literature and what literature can do, we also have to think about kind of the aesthetic and what beauty brings to it, which is what I was trying to say in my um, in my in my part of the talk, right? Anti-racist knowledge production um, and what can we learn? Um, but our ability to also create out of those conscripts is so important in the way that we write, dance, um, you know, create. So how are we using our, you know, um, imagination towards those ends as well? Um, and to not, to not solely think about the fact that we are connected through our oppressions, but we're also connected through our, you know, our livingness, our, liv our ability to live, our livability. Um, and as well in, in, the way, in the way that we create that livability, right? So what can we learn from the way that we, we create, you know, um, livable ways of being that are otherwise running outside um, the conscripts of coloniality, of racism, uh, of imposed knowledges. Um, I think literature has, for sure, has to, uh, that to offer. Music has that to offer. So um, for me, it's really to not only think of ourselves in solidarity across our multiple oppressions, of course, we're working, you know, against that. We're writing against that. We're writing towards liberation, but we're also we're also living, right? We're also creating otherwise. And I think that shared that shared knowledge and to find connections of solidarity therein is also important. I think I think Sharisa has said a whole lot. <laughs> I think I can be very brief about it. If you take West Indian critical theory, and you recognize that Babylon is the subdivision of humanity, then you recognize that that subdivision of those who are propertied, those so-called free, and those who are treated as though they are things, so-called slave, I think that holds for India at this moment in time and the anti-caste struggle. A second thing that matters is, of course, the question, the, the issue that Babylon is inside of you. So which means you're struggling against oppression, but you need to recognize that oppression only works well when you take on some of it inside of yourself. So you have to work on yourself as well. I think, I understood the person asked about feminism. I think that amongst many who suffer from gender inequality, that they have some of the gender biases also internal to them. Those who struggle against racism have some of the racial bias inside of them. I think the same would hold for those who struggle against caste as well. It's a question, but I, it would surprise me if that's not the case. Thank you. Uh, both. Uh, Next question. Hello. Uh, my question is directed to thank you. Um, my question is directed to thank you. Um, it is, uh, there, are, there are a few researchers which says that when endangered labor went to um, West Indies or like, especially in Suriname, uh, and they took their caste along with them. And, and so as the practice, uh, at the initial, uh, uh, when your presentation started, you say that caste died when they they came to West India. Um, so in states very different. In the recent times, and the research uh, also talks about how the cultural practices uh, related to caste exist in Suriname, uh, which are very much related to the, uh, uh, like marriages, especially uh, in marriages uh, uh, within same caste, it still exist uh, in Surina. Um, I just wanted to know your commentary uh, on what are, what is what are the things happening currently when it comes to the cultural practices like marriage. Uh, uh. Good question. Thank you. Um, let me let me answer it this way. 
When I said cars died when people moved, uh, I'm building on the work of people like Patricia Mohammed and so forth, because what they're saying is that you need to recognize that when you had indenture, when it started, you, you had a situation in which sometimes it was 10% of those coming that were women. So it made it very difficult to uphold it. And in the system of indenture, whether you were Brahmin or claimed to be Brahmin or you were Shudra or you were anything in between, you were treated the same on these plantation complexes. So which means that much of the privilege that perhaps was part of the common sense in India, that that privilege could not hold in the Caribbean settings. Then you get a situation in which many actually also converted to Christianity. In converting to Christianity, they did not uphold the caste system anymore. So when you look at marriages, you see that in places like Trinidad, the marriages between people who were, whose ancestors were, let's say, uh, Muslim, uh, this one of the scholars I mentioned, Anton Alahar, he said Alahar was not a name, it was just a name given. They probably heard Allah and they said, then your name is Alahar. And he said, we became Alahar afterwards. But he says, when you look at how we married, we married breaking certain caste things. Some people try to uphold it. But Alahar's point was that it is impossible that everyone could claim to be Brahmin in Trinidad. They were not Brahmins but they could move and use caste much more flexibly. So therefore he says, when you look at how oppression functions in the West Indies, it doesn't function using caste as it functioned in India because the system was not a system based upon upholding caste. The system was a system based as Dave Ramsaran, someone you can read. It was a system upholding racial logics. So caste, quickly merge into racial logics in the Caribbean. What you do have, and this is something I think that the author was getting to, is that you do have nowadays in the West Indies, the BJP trying to push caste again upon the people of the West Indies and trying to remind them about the caste hierarchies. That is an issue that's taking place right now, but it's more difficult to uphold if the rest of the system does not recognize it. And if people have escape hatches, you just go somewhere else and people say, I don't know what you're talking about. And then you get strange things. Let me just last. Uh, there's a scholar, was a scholar, very interesting scholar in the, in the Netherlands of Surinamese descent, Anil Ramdas. He spent some time in India as well. And he said when he mentioned his name, they asked, that cannot be because you're, you can't have this as a surname. But he said, it was a surname for me. So he said the Hinduism that survived was a very different kind of Hinduism and could not be fully conflated to the Hinduism in India. But he noticed that Indian versions of Hinduism was coming into Suriname. So I guess that is what the author is seeing. Or the person who asked the question. Thank you, uh, Francio and Sharita. So uh, I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and we are engaged with your uh, thoughts and your presence today. Uh, I think this sharing of knowledge uh, should continue and uh, we should keep meeting on uh, such platform. And I also wish that uh, you two should come to India and visit Nalanda sometime. And uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. us and hosting us. It was us. a pleasure. And I will visit uh, one of these days and sit down and talk to people and try to learn from that yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharisa. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Francio. Uh, with that, we conclude the Ayan Kali Memorial uh, 
lecture and uh, uh, dr francio started with a story about like how uh, you know uh, uh, sachin tendulkar is uh, known as a uh, i'm i'm somehow sitting in the darkness while ayan kali is lit behind me i guess that's fine uh, but like you know sachin tendulkar uh, is known as the face of indian cricket in the west indies and uh, i would like to uh, close this on the idea that sachin made his debut with uh, uh, like sachin's career is synonymous with the career of a dalit cricketer vinod kambli and uh, they both uh, were uh, supposedly very equally talented and share a world record as school children and whereas sachin got fast tracked into the national team and was allowed to build his game for years vinod kambli played test cricket only for 2 years and he was removed from the team even though he had an average of above 54 if i'm not wrong and in many which will story the parallel stories of sachin and kambli uh, uh mirror sort of like you know the knowledges that we build on cast uh, interestingly kambli went on to play uh, in domestic uh, cricket of south africa in the 90s uh, at a time when uh, nobody used to do that so i think uh, when we think about uh 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 building knowledges and these uh, conversations uh south south praxis india caribbean uh, caste race all these intersections i think it's important also to connect these stories and uh you know sachin and uh, arundhati roy and all of these your, your upper caste uh, uh uh scholarship who in many which ways have come to define some of uh, these things and uh, maybe you know in the spirit of ayan kali we'll find uh, newer bolder voices thank you so much everybody uh, thank you to our audience as well as uh, everybody else who has joined us online uh, thank you everyone jai bhim that's all out from today thank you bye bye